that is government operations Monday, um, May 11th. And <clears throat> committee, I think what we talked about doing today was looking at, we're supposed to, we had a little explanation um, this morning from the pro tem, uh, Tim and Ginny and I did, because he's calling in all chairs to ask what bills right. we want to pass. And we actually, I think are going to be um, okay with everything we want to do. I'll just update you on that before we get started. So what bills we have, um, I've asked um, for finance to take up 233 and 220. And um, we will go through the remainder of 124 um, probably on Friday because then we're gonna look at law enforcement that day. And that's in appropriations. And we'll look at the remainder of that. The, from the house bills that we have that uh, seem to be must passes are the 788, the technical corrections bill, uh, 438, which is the medical board and um, Betsy and Jen are working on some uh, amendments to that that would then allow the dovetailing of 233 and um, H438 right. and 554 which is the Weathersfield um, charter because they want it before their next town meeting. Um, H793, which is the auditor's bill, which isn't an emergency, but there is no controversy. It's just some technical corrections and it really needs to get fixed. The statutes are so out of date. And um, the, uh, the last one is um, H558, which is the um, exempting the victim's compensation board from the right. open meeting law. And we'll hear from that. There was some controversy. The only controversy was from the press, but we'll hear from them. And it's a weird situation because they're, you, they're reviewing um, victims' compensation issues. But because it's an open meeting, they can't um, use the people's names and they can't even use their case numbers to refer to. So it, it's a very odd situation. And then when they, they're in this really strange setting. So when they, they have to um, publicize where they're going to meet and then and keep the doors unlocked. And then when they go into executive session to actually talk about the, the confidential records, the people have to go sit in their cars or in the parking lot. So everybody can see who's, it's a, a very bizarre, setting and we'll hear from Chris Fenno and I'm sure we'll hear from the press, but they, so they're, uh, they were the only ones that opposed it, but it really is um, a pretty sensitive area. So we'll hear from them. Okay, yeah, so that's- Hugely sensitive and to be not discuss the cases, uh, frankly and openly with, you know, the open meeting law wasn't meant to be a hindrance of actually making progress on behalf of, cons of people. Yeah. Right, so we will, we'll hear from them and we'll hear from the press and um, figure out what we're going to do with it. It did pass the house, but the others, um, I think we can just go ahead with them. I think um, they're gonna have a rules committee meeting tomorrow right up right after the floor i th or right before the floor one of the two and we'll get permission to vote on them Good. tomorrow okay my guess is it's after because we have a lessons learned meeting at 8 30. okay whatever they're going to do it at some point so now speaking of lessons learned i think that um chris uh, correct me if I'm wrong here. Chris was in this meeting this morning with um, the pro tem. He had, he's calling in three chairs at a time to talk about bills going forward. And it happened to be Chris and Ginny and I. So actually it was like sitting in our um, rented house up there with having Tim and Peter joining us. That so was, was pretty funny. Okay. But um, where was the crossword? 
where was the crossword puzzle? That was the question. <laughs> we weren't doing it. So um, what we talked about was the kind of one group is looking at the um, at the kind of reopening and how how that's going to happen, and then the other one is on um, what what were the when this hit, what were the things that were so immediately out of whack that we need to address them. So I thought that our committee could start talking about those things. And today talking about um, municipalities and um, OPR, those two areas. Is that what your understanding was that we were gonna do? Yes. Okay. So what are the things that we, um, learned did you did everybody get karen horns no um, i haven't seen Abby, but i haven't been here this morning so i i didn't get anything before um she I sent got it. It. just got it did it just come this morning I it's an email it like 10 minutes ago oh great oh, there she is oh okay. i didn't realize you were with us okay so, should pull so it up. um so why don't we just oh. start the the conversation. Um, Karen, do you want to kind of bring us into the conversation? Thank you. Um, and I'm going to drink my soup. Thank you for bringing us into the conversation. Um, so we sent, after I received your email um, Friday, maybe? Mm -hmm. Saturday, um, maybe. I don't know. Saturday, maybe? I sent an um, email out to some of our folks and um, just asking them what kinds of thoughts they had. And I've received a few responses back. So on the first part of this, um, it's just general thoughts, things that um, Gwen and I have been understanding over the last several weeks. And then some comments from um, some of the local officials who, who actually were able to get back to me um, yesterday afternoon for the most part. So, and, and I think there are no surprises for you here. Um, we, we really think that um, towns need to have flexibility to respond to these kinds of crises or, or whatever the next crisis is. I'm always reminded that we prepare for the last emergency. We, we're not very good at looking prospectively for what the next emergency might be. Um, and then with re res respect to those lessons learned around this emergency, um, we need to institutionalize remote or mail voting capacity for voters in general. We've, I've been in several discussions in the House Education Committee recently about the school districts that have not yet had votes on their budgets. And, and so that's a significant issue. And, and Will Senning can certainly talk to that at some point. Um, everybody agrees that a technology to allow for remote work, teleconferencing and high-speed internet has to be in place um, going forward that people are going to be interested in remote working in the long term uh, and, and that for personal safety, as we learn more about COVID-19, that that's something that um, really needs to be in place. And if you hear it raining on the roof, my car, because I'm in the schoolyard today, <laughs> just on that point. <laughs> and then, uh, and another issue that we're understanding, and I think the state it, um, fiscal issues is making very clear is that you, when you have reserves, you're in a much better position to address these kinds of unforeseen circumstances and that um, having some kind of reserve is an important function of municipal fiscal responsibility. Um, we are being asked to pivot to providing services on a whole range of issues that we haven't really um, understood as traditional functions for local government. And I think on this point that some of the larger communities are being asked to do more in that regard um, than smaller communities, but like managing volunteers, providing, helping with providing meals, um, 
addressing uh, a, a shelter for appropriate shelter for homeless population. Um, all those kinds of things are are things that towns have really, um, in in some instances, had to step up and and provide. And then, um, as you've expressed in your in your um, legislation on the emergency medical service providers, that having funding, training assistance, and protections for for the people who we really depend on in a crisis is absolutely key and needs to be sustained. sustained. And then um, the education property tax system is broken in, in case you didn't realize that. So um, we are going to, um, I, I've been spending a whole lot of time in the House Ways and Means and Senate Finance Committees on the issue of education um, property tax funding and what the municipal role is there, the town role. Um, so those are just some of the issues. And then um, you can see down below that, uh, that the folks that we heard from are very interested in making sure that the measures that we've put in place and that the governor's put in place um, remain available and in place for, for the next time this comes around and the next time might be as early as the fall i mean so that's sort of where we are today and i and you please be aware that this is basically thrown together and i maybe just a place to start a conversation i, I think thank you this is helpful to start the conversation i think this is great brian thank you madam chair karen i don't mean to get into the weeds quickly but when you say, I mean, no, and I don't necessarily disagree with you, but when you mentioned the education property tax system being broken, are you are you thinking specifically of one or two things there, or is is that not a appropriate question? Well, the the issue that's um, come up is that, and and I could go so far into the weeds, so please stop me. <laughs> but the issue there is that um, municipalities collect and bill, um, bill and collect the education property tax. Um, they do so on a, under ordinary circumstances on a timeline that's fairly tight. Um, once that they, they can't actually bill until they get the homestead um, declaration information and property tax credit education property tax credit information from the state. And that's all dependent on when budgets are um, adopted. It, it's just sort of a whole cascade of um, events that it seems could be much more simplified. And, and that's just the scheduling piece of it. You okay. know, like when the listers file the grand list and what's entailed in that and you know do we do inspection all those kinds of issues okay thank you allison so just to tag on to brian's concern so you don't mean that income sensitivity is necessarily broken you just mean that the the town's role needs to be reviewed and may and seen with new eyes as a result of this of what we've gone through in the last 10 weeks the um, the most immediate issue for towns is the um, the the sort of the methodology of how it all gets billed and collected and remitted to the state. But the larger issue, not necessarily around income sensitivity, but the larger issue about how we raise money for the education fund is also a huge issue. I mean, right now you've got people who are not going to be able to pay their property taxes um, and uh, you've got you know not just school budgets municipal budgets also but you, you there's there's not a lot of um, flexibility built into the system you know you have to collect the property taxes you have to provide them to the education fund that means that it, people are still on the hook for them and What's the end result of that? The end result is that if people can't pay, they lose their um, property. But but that, that is gonna, that's going to be a problem 
any way, whether it's based on income, whether it's based on property. I mean, people just don't necessarily have the cash at this moment. So looking at how we deal with it more flexibly with less punitive measures when we, or perhaps is perhaps, okay. I, 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 th I think there are a couple things here. There's the, the immediate thing of how, how the process works and how the timing works. And that, that um, can be, we, we can look at that. Then there's the larger question of how do we fund education? Right. Exactly. And how do we keep, we pri primarily now we fund it through the sales tax and property tax. And is the property tax the appropriate way to complete, to fund the education tax to such an extent? And, and I think that's a larger conversation, right. but I, I do believe that that's a conversation that has to be had. And right. my, my feeling is that it's probably, it never really happens very well because nobody knows exactly where it lives and nobody wants to take it on. Does it live in the education committee or the finance committee? And so, but it is a conversation that we have to have. But, but the immediate lessons learned in terms of flexibility and how can we build in flexibility when we need it quickly? How can we pivot uh, yeah. in times of need is I think an immediate question in terms of lessons learned. Well, yes. we're not learning very quickly right now since S344 hasn't even gone to the governor yet. Right. And, and so, there, here we made an emergency measure designed to pivot quickly that is still not law yeah right. very frustrating very frustrating but so do you have suggestions about how that should be changed or just um allowing more flexibility or well um this is karen horn again uh we are working with the um House Ways and Means Committee on some of these issues, and they are putting a proposal in one of their bills. I, I think it may be the miscellaneous tax bill. I have to circle around on that again, that would direct the Department of Taxes to look at what it would take to um, transition to them collecting the, pro the education property tax. And in committee, um, the commissioner of the Department of Taxes said, well, if we're going to have this conversation, now is a good time because we're just starting to work with a new grand list software vendor. I know, um, so I think that that is a conversation that likely will be had in the next year. So uh, may I ask, so yeah. is NAMFREC, I mean, are they actually, get their two systems now, are they getting rid of the, both those systems and trying to go to one? The um, Department of Taxes has, um, they have a new vendor for grand list software. And um, if I can send you some information that came from the D Director of Property Valuation Review on that, but you, if if you want to delve into this more, you may want to have Jill Remick in to talk about it to you. Right. So I guess I guess you can have the overall conversation at the same time or later because there will always be some dependence on the property tax for yeah. education. Yeah. But so whatever system they design um, could be applied whether the uh, reliance on the property taxes, 90% or 10%. Right. And we've just, and we had the Blue Ribbon Tax Commission uh, several years ago, and now we have a tax review, the, the group of three that are still actively working yeah. on their recommendations. So I, this is uh, current in that those three are still working. I, can, I never can remember the name of that, commi that, that, that tax commission. But the tax are, structure, act, yeah, yeah, tax they are actively commission. looking at this. So I, you know, our conversations now should be able to be fed into their thinking now. Um, but I guess I'd like to ask you, Karen. Uh, I think that we've learned a huge about uh, uh, 
about building in flexibilities, just even for snowstorms and stuff, for, for people to be able to, uh, again, be flexibly use remote meeting opportunities. You know, when you have a crippling ice storm or snowstorm and you have a select board meeting, you can, you can not have to cancel it necessarily unless there's no power. But it, it would be great to be able to provide some flexibility for towns to be able to decide when they want to, want to exercise and use these opportunities. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that's, that's excellent. And, and as I said earlier, I mean, I think we're going to be in this particular crisis with remote meetings for quite some time. And um, so people will get accustomed to these ways of working. I don't think we're going back entirely to where we were in February. I, it'll be curious. I, I think uh, people, people miss each other. And uh, if, if communication, 99% of communication is nonverbal, uh, we're missing out on a huge amount of what's being conveyed, quite frankly, when you So I, I have the feeling that people, when they have the opportunity to meet in person again, will be there. But I think you're right, the flexibility, I think we need to allow for more flexibility and for towns to be able to call that when they need. So in terms of that one issue, do we, um, I'm not sure the process here and how this is going to work, but um, being prepared, what we learned to be prepared for the next one, not necessarily even what we learned for forever, but to be prepared for the next one. Do we need to do something that, some kind of legislation that does specifically that, that allows the towns to make those decisions on their own instead of having um, us have to get together every single time there's something that they can't meet? Is uh, I, that what? I think that's what I hear Karen suggesting. Anthony, did you have your hand up? Well, I was just to say, I think that is what she's suggesting. Maybe what we do is we give towns, instead of saying the town shall do it this way, we would say the towns may do it this way or that way, depending on what they choose. It seems like we're giving a lot of latitude to the towns in that case, but it's probably the right thing to do. Yeah, I agree. When I, the other day I mentioned, do we want to keep doing what we're doing in terms mm -hmm. of not designating a, a physical space and all that, which some people would say undermines the public, op the openness of it. On the other hand, people are saying it's more open now than it was before because everybody can go online and watch. So it's just, I'm sort of just, I'm mulling that over in my brain as we talk through this. Brian? So I just would suggest that another option would be given the work that we did with whatever it is, not uh, picking a physical location or changing the open meeting law situation and all the other things that we did to allow some flexibility for municipalities, we could just look at those bills and in essence change the dates uh, to whatever the situation was at the time. In other words, rather than go full tilt, mm -hmm. let's change it for keeps, it, this would allow us to, each time the, the declaration is made, for instance, we're still under a stay at home order, I think till the 15th. Once the 16th happens, if the governor hasn't done anything else, that goes away. But if it's reinstituted at a future date, I don't see that there's a big problem getting together as a committee again and taking a look at all the bills that we did and just reinstituting them by using the same exact language, but changing the date. I think you could even be more flexible than that probably by just um, saying that the, in whatever we wanna call it in normal times, that there has to be a physical location because I do think that that is an important thing to maintain. But that um, as much as possible, people should continue um, doing it this way because as Anthony said, there are more people that can actually watch and follow it. And that in when there's, give the town some flexibility in determining when there's an emergency that might need to, um, have them 
make the switch so that they don't have to have a physical location because it might be, um, I, I mean, this one is statewide. <coughs> Irene, I don't think was statewide. It was focused, there was an emergency declared in certain areas. And I'm thinking of the ice storm whenever that was the huge right. ice storm up north. We didn't have it, but it was terrible up there. So let the towns have some flexibility to determine when, when they see that there's an emergency that would um, preclude them from having an, a physical location meeting. And right. some of them might be too hard to do. I mean, if you have a meeting set for tonight and suddenly there's an ice storm, it's a little hard to, but if you have um, it already set up to do it remotely also, you can just plug into that, I would think. I don't know how you would word that. Allison? Well, uh, obviously, I, I agree having ch chatted about that, that because those ice, you know, that kind of thing to be able to to shift uh, with with a day or two's notice, I think is is would be great. Um, but I also think one doesn't preclude the other. I mean, you right. can have a physical location and still have Zoom yeah. participants look at the governor's press conferences. They have a physical location. They're there and some of them are there in real time. Some of them are there remotely and all the reporters all over the state are are uh, far more present and able to uh, ask questions. So mm -hmm. um, it strikes me that in some ways this expands on both possibilities, you know, and, and doesn't need to mitigate either one. I mean, you can do both. Well, I think we have Tucker with us someplace. I thought I saw him. And um, yes, yes, there you are. And I think that um, we might be able to to craft it in a way that um, does give flexibility so that if if there is a statewide declared emergency that precludes people from coming to a physical location, it can just automatically happen. And then if, if it's um, a local emergency, it can be decided right. by the by the select board. I think that's, is that possible that to craft, Tucker? Yes, that would be possible to craft. And as uh, Senator Collimore indicated earlier, you already have language mm -hmm. that would allow that to be triggered. It would just be a question of whether that's going to be a permanent provision, or as you've been discussing, whether it would be something that would be temporary and dependent on your future action. Um, the conversation for the last two minutes, it sounds like you're considering having this be a permanent provision that would be triggered by the declaration of a state of emergency. You could certainly do that. And you could have a division between local emergencies, which you would likely have to define, and the statewide emergencies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or not only, not just statewide, but um, area-wide, if, if the governor, for example, declares an emergency in three counties, which, um, which he did, as you point out, and Irene, right. that was very uh, county specific. But, but also, if we're going to be allow for flexibilities for towns, the select board needs to be able to say, we're getting a crippling ice storm in two days. We are going to do our select board meeting uh, two days from now. We're going to do that remotely. It, yeah, know, I think that's what Tucker said. Well, said he could do that. He, we could do that. We could allow right. for the, the, it could either be at a, a, a declared emergency statewide or regionwide by the governor or that the select board itself has the flexibility to, right. to declare the emergency. The, Is that I, right, I, Tucker? You could certainly do something like that, yes. Right. All right, so let's, is there other, other than <clears throat> open meetings? I mean, we know that uh, in order to really do this well and th uh, this my guess is going to come from every single committee is that we need to have better infrastructure you mean on it yes yes I, I, because we have school kids who can't access um their lessons and their teachers we have karen sitting in the parking lot at the school we have so <laughs> karen I, I mean, is the poster child <laughs> we, so we need and I think that's going to come from every committee, that suggestion that we need to improve that. Yes, and I believe finance is taking it on. 
I mean, I, I believe finance is, uh, because in our conversations in Senate Economic Development, it's been obviously a top priority uh, to add this to our, our COVID money from the feds. And But I believe from my understanding is that the three members who are on both committees, that finance is gonna take the lead on that. Okay. So Karen, I have a question about um, <clears throat> reserves. Yes. Um, currently you can have a, we used to call it when I was on the select board, a sinking fund yeah. like for our um, new plow truck and our new whatever we had to buy. Yes. But are you not allowed to have just a general reserve? Well, um, it, it's one of, another one of those issues where some towns do it and other towns don't see the specific um, authority for it. So mm -hmm. it might be something to look at a little bit more. Okay. Um, so it isn't necessarily that they don't want to do it, but they don't see that they actually have the authority to have a, a reserve fund and feel that if you have a, because I do know there are some towns that feel if you have a reserve fund, you have to put it back into the, you know, pay back the taxpayers. The taxpayers. In the next, yes. 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 So yeah. having some. So there is some, there's a discussion that would be good to have there okay. around the issue. Okay. All right. Other um, things I'm looking at. Well, if you go all the way down to the bottom there. Uh -huh. just, this is something that the town of Thetford has raised and mm -hmm. um, 19 BSA section 312 says that you have to keep your highway funds in a separate account like you cannot, um, you can't uh, use them in the same way you would other general funds where like the select board or the state for that matter, sometimes moves money around to balance out different line items and then moves it back. Um, you can't do that with highway funds apparently. And this is an archaic statute. Um, and so the, uh, we, we do think it makes sense to get rid of 19 BSA section 3, 312. I would be happy to come back and talk about that when you all, um, uh, I've had a chance to read it. And, and also Nick Clark, who's one of the selectmen, I think he's the chair of the select board in Thetford right now. Um, he would be happy to come talk about that issue as well. Okay. Uh, Karen, doesn't the Department of Public Works have more than just the highway? I mean, it, isn't it sewer and, or water conceivably or any public work? That, it's I mean, actually... The, the, the particular statute is specific to the highway budget. Oh, is it? Even though it has a general name? Yeah. Well, so, he said DP, DPW, but he, oh, he's, we don't yeah. know. It's we don't know what the statute says. So I think, that, Brian. Thank you. Is that for the only town that's ever mentioned this? I don't. When it was put in the statute, there was probably a good reason. I, I don't know what that was, but I'm just get. I'm I just the point I want to make is if it's just one town suggesting that, I don't know that it's that critical an issue. Can I also? Oh, I, my understanding I think, is that. I'm sorry. Chris had his hand up, and then Anthony. Um, is, is it related to this question? Yeah. It, okay. Right. I mean the, the same thing. I just. So we'll have to learn more, happy to learn more. Um, one thing yeah. that is unusual is that there's a state allocation to road projects, right? So I, yeah. I, I can imagine the state being a little more fussy about where those funds land or something like that. Well, um, if I may, just to that point, um, we would, it, it should be very clear that you're only talking about locally voted highway funds, not, not anything that comes from the state or any other level of government. Yeah. Anthony? Well, I could be wrong, but I think Nick or someone told me that some towns have dealt with this through their charters. So there are there are other towns that have dealt with it or had not either dealt with it or didn't need to deal with it because it was in their charters. 
allowing them to do this. Is that right, Karen? Is that true? I, I believe so, but I'd have to go back and, and pull out that language, you know, find that okay. language in the charters. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it, it really didn't have anything to do with the COVID situation. It's just while no, we're no. doing it, why don't we take a look at this kind of right? Well, I think it might have been related to COVID because they can't, if they have fun, if they have funds in their highway budget and now are finding that they can't because of COVID-19 can't do some of the projects that they had anticipated doing they can't use those funds for any other purpose yeah it did it is right. something that came up as a result of COVID where towns were looking again for a little flexibility in how to spend their funds um, on issues that are you know, that they have to address now because of COVID and other things that are not going to be dealt with immediately because the circumstances aren't there right now. Okay, thank you. Allison, did you have a comment? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, having just talked about education and property tax, that's also required to be kept quite separate. I mean, there are other funds that we require to be handled distinctly and separately. The, I, I, the, that's not a municipal budget, though. Oh, I see what you mean. This is okay. Even this though it's handled and managed, you pass, it'll you pass up. A, a municipal budget of a hundred dollars, and thirty-five of that dollars was for the highway fund. And you find now that you can't do the projects. You Got can it. only do ten dollars worth of projects. That other twenty-five dollars is just sitting there. You can't use that to to do whatever you need to do because to put in a new computer system in your um, office or whatever, even though it's your the money that was raised through your municipal tax. Got it. So it's not it, it's not commingled with state transportation dollars. No. Right, which is okay, right, which is what somebody said earlier, Brian or something. So I have heard from a couple other towns about this. It it reminds me of the Allison, you should remember this. Woodstock cannot use any of its parking meter money for anything except to buy new parking meters. I know, and we dealt with that. Yeah, for what? Yeah, <laughs> but anyway, the the um, so we could we can we can take care of that. We can yeah. hear some more testimony on that and take care of that, yeah. right, Tucker? Tucker is Tucker's thinking about it. Yeah, no, he's not. He put his thumbs up. <laughs> Um, okay, what other issues? Uh, there was the issue of um, equipment and uh, supplies. Is that right? Um, so the, the uh, comment from some of the towns, Swanton was one of them, is that they need supplies. Um, that's not necessarily just a municipal issue. Every, everybody needs supplies, that's why there aren't any. Um, but uh, so, so I think they're just sort of flagging that in general that, and, and uh, there was another comment in here mm -hmm. that, that Vermont um, would do well to be a little more self-reliant in terms of those kinds of supplies, but yeah. And you are, those are budget items, of course, that, that towns as everybody else are, are incurring now that they didn't necessarily expect to be incurring. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's yeah. That's a, a slightly okay. different issue in terms of helping to solve that in an ongoing capacity. This is interesting from um, Swanton, who said that they found that trustees meetings were really hard to hold. So they chose not to hold them. And because they have town ma manager form of government, they just went ahead and did stuff. Yeah, that was a little. Well, the town is... manager does have specific responsibilities yeah. in the statute. So yeah. yeah. So if you we have are... a town manager, yeah. You, you can continue to do some things, but there are still some things you that you would need our approval to do anyway, unless you had it in your charter. So may I ask a question about that? Uh -huh. uh, Karen, uh, every town that has a town manager falls under those statutory uh, 
town manager, you know, manager, not just Swanton. Yeah. So if you uh, have a town manager form of government, which is something that you voted, that the voters voted at some point in time, then you are subject to the statute in Title 24 on town managers. And anything that's different from that would be in your governance charter. Having said that, if you have a town administrator or something like that, right. that person does not fall under the town manager statute. It's the select board hires that person and writes the job description and, and it's outside of the town manager statute. But aren't most town managers hired that way? I mean, I don't, I mean, you have mayors who are elected, but town managers tend to be hired by the select board. Yeah, town managers yeah, they are, are hired. hired by the select right. board. Right, so what and makes them different from an administrator? They are administrators. No, well, it's you have two to different think things. Terms, you have to think in terms of um, legal terms. So town manager is, uh, is a term in the statute. And if you're hired as a town manager, you're subject to the statute. The town administrator position kind of grew up in other municipalities that don't have town managers and they perform a number of the same functions, not always all the same functions, but they're not subject to the town manager statute. That, I mean, it's Vermont, what can I say? But you and they don't have the same level of authority as the right. town managers have. Town managers have a great deal of authority, and town administrators do not. And and I have to say that um, having been involved with lots of towns and their select boards, there are towns that where the select board and the town manager are always at odds, and then there are towns that. Um, treat their town manager like a town administrator and uh, the select board retains most of the authority and the town manager and some of them have a good relationship that way and some of them don't and uh, Karen you might think I'm all wet here but and and some town administrators do more than they probably should be doing so it, it's all over the place but if you have a town manager form of government, they have certain, uh, they have a, a lot more authority. But you had to have voted to have a town manager form right, of government. Right. Yeah, and that was, uh, that clearly my neck of the woods was a while ago. Um, Karen, when you are able, I'd love to know how many of our 251 towns, how many have town managers, how many have mayors, how many have mayors and managers, how many have administrators? I mean, it would just be interesting to see Who's governed by what? Yeah, we definitely well. have those numbers. There, there are eight mayors. That's easy. There are nine right. cities and eight mayors. Um, and uh, there are at least four of those cities that also have managers. But I will get you the list. It is kind yeah, of okay. interesting. Yeah. Just with, if I may just say with respect to this um, comment from Swanton, mm -hmm. Swanton has an electric department. Mm -hmm. So it's the, the village trustees in Swanton if do mostly electric department stuff so um oh so anyway you might put that in that context a little bit yeah. okay yep they're all so, everybody's so different it's so interesting yeah and um and it works for some like what um i know there were a couple towns down here at one point who really wanted to have a town manager, but neither town could justify having a town manager. But so they talked about sharing a town manager. Um, and sometimes that might work and sometimes not. But um, my, you know, you know, my thoughts on local government and, and towns and shires. And so I won't even go there. So May I just ask, yes. Madam Chair, speaking of uh, 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 our priorities, I can't remember the name of our, our town uh, liberation bill, but what? what 106. Where is 106, right. So where is that as a priority in the House? Has anyone talked about that as a priority? Because no. actually it's very, it's very relevant now in these conversations. 
it is, is very relevant and no they have not talked about it so we might want to have that conversation just because actually lessons learned su supports the, a lot of the work in that bill they do yes that's why i'm thinking about it as we're having this conversation i feel like wow this would be a great time to have those pilots because it's it, you know in some ways this COVID challenge is a launching pad for that conversation. Yep. Well, we'll we can we can push them to see if they can. We'll take it up. I, it seemed like I don't know if if they're on the floor today or not. John Gannon um, a lot, watches a lot. I don't know that he is right now, but mm -hmm. if you are, John. If you are, John, so, we actually would like to revisit this <laughs> because. I, I, I think it does ad address exactly, I mean, many of these issues. So would you expand just a little bit, Karen, on um, the municipalities being um, asked to pivot to provide services that aren't traditionally seen as, I mean, we've seen that in our schools a lot. And now I guess we're seeing it in our municipalities. Can you just expand on that a little bit and how we might go forward with that? Yeah, so, um, and I apologize, my computer just ran out of power, so um, <laughs> I don't have my list in front of me anymore, but, but um, the, for instance, the city of Burlington, which I realize is the biggest city, but they set up a resource recovery center, and they're doing everything from um, providing, you know, managing the volunteers who are sewing face masks to um, helping people with meals to, um, to uh, th they're just doing a huge, I'll send you the link for their website. Okay. The, the city of Rutland is likewise engaged with um, a lot of the nonprofits in the area to um, assure that people get the, those kinds of services when they need them. Um, the town of Johnson, which is a smaller community, actually, it, do, it has a village and a town also. Um, and they've uh, put in place some measures to, to help manage volunteers. So, um, so those are all kinds of things that towns haven't mm -hmm. done very much of in the past. At this, at the same time, on the on the other side, a, a lot of towns. I'll just mention this, but a lot of towns that traditionally have summer recreation programs are really wondering whether that's going to be a possibility this year, and um, some have already canceled their summer recreation programs. So then the question is, like, what do you do instead? You know, because it's childcare in summer for a lot of people. For a ton. Yeah, so mm -hmm. there and 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 the recreation departments as services is are are mostly embedded in towns in town municipal government. Yeah, they are. Like yeah. Okay, I don't know how we if there are things that we learn that we can apply. But what 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 is the issue yeah. that comes up? I mean, um I don't I don't know that I mean, Yeah, I don't I don't know what how What's we, the issue um, that we would solve or not solve? I mean, to me, I'm not clear on that. Well, so, um, part of this is, I'm sorry, I, go ahead. part of this is just sort of flagging things as they're mm -hmm. arising. And some of these discussions might not be quite ripe yet, but, mm -hmm. and, we'll, and we'll see what happens as the, um, as the summer moves along, but um, they are, what what's happening in some of those communities is they're spending resources where they never did mm -hmm. before and they're not Got spending it. resources where they did. Got it. So which certainly so is a reason to do the transportation fund thing, whether there are other um yeah. So um if I may, I, I do think that the mayor of Barry is on this call, Lucas Herring's on this call. I don't know if he might have oh. anything to add to this conversation. Oh, well, thank you. I am on the call. I'm only listening peripherally at this moment, though. So um, I guess if there's anything specific you'd like to have for answers, 
um, I'll answer any specific questions you might have. Well, if you have any suggestions around um, both kind of transitioning back to where we might have been before and and on the issues that we've talked about and any other issues that you can think of that we really need to be addressing as we move forward. Please go ahead and throw them out. Sure, uh, some of the concerns we've had, um, of course, we've been implementing more bill payment online as much as possible. Um, our restart is probably going to slowly follow what the state does because of all of our deficits that have been incurred uh, we have a loss of revenue from the meter sales, our uh, alumni hall and auditorium that are rentals. Of course, we are not generating any revenues from that. And we've had to take actions on uh, the bill that will be coming out for our fourth quarter payment on May 15th. Uh, we're looking to abate any of the late fees that are associated with that payment. So those that have not yet received a unemployment check, for example, uh, they're held harmless during this last quarter of the year. So we're just, we're looking at trying to find ways that either revenue can be reimbursed back to the municipality. Uh, we're looking at, you know, a large deficit, not only this year, but next fiscal year as well, uh, as we try to restart ourselves. Um, for the other examples, uh, we do have a number of restaurants. There's a, uh, process going on right now by, I can't remember the organization's name that has formed but it, they, they call themselves don't 86s. It's the restaurants that they're not able to transition to curbside or delivery service. And when they are looking to have 10 or more people in their establishment, that's not something that's going to happen June 1st when other businesses are starting back up. So uh, the reason why I bring that up on the municipal side is we gain a local options tax based on the uh, rooms, meals, and alcohol tax on some of those establishments. And any uh, money that they're not raising, again, we're not creating a, a revenue stream from them that comes into our municipality. Those funds are mainly geared for our streets and sidewalks projects. So again, it's just another revenue stream that we're not able to yeah. receive. So those are all things that um, we're trying to think of as we try to restart. Uh, we will be having a budget conversation in June related to what we forecast for revenues in FY21 because it will be a downgrade and we will need to make sure that we're um, changing our expense patterns to match that unless there's any other support that the state or federal government will be providing. So may I ask, um, given that we were just coming off that conversation about uh, uh, lost revenue we're clear on uh, because that's been an issue right through, but the additional expenditure of services that municipalities have taken on as additional services, have you seen an in increase in, in those and your choice to become, uh, you've chosen to be a generous municipality in terms of what of, of revenue you've chosen to give up, but what about the uh, uh, additional expenditures you've had in terms of services? So for services, since a number of those items have gone online, uh, the people that manage the online payments are individuals like the city clerk, who she is a salaried position. Uh, many of the positions are salaried. So even if it came to reimbursement for overtime hours, it's, it's not something that we're realizing. Uh, we've implemented a furlough program for many of our support staff, for example, because in order for us to uh, try to keep down that deficit, some of the services are just not being provided. Uh, what we have seen, though, in our area are groups like Downstreet and Capstone and other social service groups. Uh, there's a, a large group called Thrive, which is 40 plus organizations that provide services to the most needy here in the central Vermont area, they've actually come together and formed their own group in order to provide those services. So that's not something that the city has taken on for expenses, although we have had our deputy fire chief be a member of that group and their conversations so that we do remain in contact. Again, that's a salaried position, so there's not additional expenses being incurred in that fashion. And then we are documenting anything that is an expense for say it's PPE or training or, or other items that staff have to have. 
but those are minimal uh, compared to um, you know what the federal declaration of a, a disaster area are. Uh, so mainly what we've been trying to do is is cut back on the face-to-face -face interactions you know and, and if we were to spend more I think it would be in those areas where we build out our online capability if there was uh, changes with uh, public records for example and we could digitize all of our records that way there if uh, someone wanted to come in to view records within the vault well if it's already online and digital then we would not have to have them come in unless they needed to make a copy for some reason of something that we can't digitize uh, but according to our current uh, uh, public records laws, uh, those need to be kept in that area. Um, so, I mean, there's areas for improvement that could be done that could help us in the long run. Uh, but as far as the fees on our side or expenses that we're incurring, we're trying to keep those as a minimum as much as possible. Thank you. So if I can ask one, another question here. Um, the just for your information committee and everybody else, the digitizing letter did go out. Although I didn't call it digitizing, I called it bringing Vermont land, bringing Vermont records into the 21st century. That's that's what we called it. Go ahead. Um, so that letter has Gail just sent me a note that that letter has gone to all of those people, and um, we hopefully um, it would be great if they came up with. Um, some kind of a, an initial budget that might be needed that could come out of CARES money. Um, whether they can do that that quickly or not, I don't know, but it would be great if they could come up with just a, a rough initial budget to get started anyway. So Karen, one of the other things in here, the general thoughts was um, training assistance. Yes. And I know we've, talked about it for the EMS people, but are there other other training things that like, um, I think that the state, we abandoned our health officers at one point and mm -hmm. um, well, we stopped funding them at the state and yet expect them. I don't think we've ever reversed that or solved that one. But anyway, are there other training um, needs here that that we learned about that would be needed? Well, one of the training needs that you were talking about before actually, but is even more relevant now is around cybersecurity. Okay. Um, so, so that's a big one. We are, um, we've been having training around the new grand list software, um, with Jill Remick from the Department of Taxes because uh, clerks, treasurers, listers, everybody's gonna have to get up to speed on that. And um, then we've also, well, the Depart Department of Emergency Management has done some trainings on FEMA and the disaster declaration and how you, um, keep track for reimbursables as the mayor mentioned that a couple minutes ago. And then we're um, at the league, we're um, trying to put together a list of trainings that would, that will be helpful to local officials as they sort of navigate the new remote working workplace um, unemployment issues, everything that's coming down in terms of compliance with the CARES Act and whatever might come after that. So I, I could get you a more complete sort of landscape from our Municipal Assistance Center. They've been talking a lot about what our training needs. Okay, that would be great. So are there other, Brian? Thank you, Madam Chair. Lucas, I just had a quick question. The bill that would authorize the local legislative body to uh, change the due dates for the property tax uh, and also, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, take away if they so choose the penalties for not paying on time. If that bill were to get signed by Thursday of this week, I understand you said you were date right now is Friday of this week, correct? The 15th? 
Correct. Our uh, fourth quarter tax bill is due on May 15th. As is Rutland City's, by the way. Um, would that, if it were to become law on Thursday, would that allow you enough time for that local legislative body to meet and change that date if they so desired? So what we've been doing in the meantime is uh, it's not just the property tax, but we also have our water and sewer bills that we're abating. And the process is to have our board of abatement uh, review these every two weeks as we meet as a city council. So we have a warned meeting at 715 when council starts at seven. Uh, the board of abatement is our city council plus the city clerk and the uh, assessor. Uh, so when that body meets, we make sure that those other individuals are also at the meeting. We call the meeting to order. Um, and of course, there's other people too. Uh, actually, uh, Representative Anthony uh, from Barry City is the chair. And what he'll do is ask for us to abate the taxes and fees associated with or I shouldn't say taxes, fees and late uh, penalties uh, associated with any of the water and sewer bills. And it would be the same thing for the tax bill uh, for that period. So uh, every two weeks, we're making sure that that is removed. And what will happen is our, our meeting on May 19th, uh, anything that did not come in on May 15th, it'll be a part of that conversation of abating the penalties that were associated with that tax bill. So if the bill is signed, it just means that we don't have to have that joint meeting anymore. City Council would be able to have the authority to sign off on this uh, for the duration that we've already set in motion. Uh, and it means that the Board of Abatement just doesn't need to meet along with us during that time period. Does that mean that you really didn't need the bill? Um, I, I think it is better to have the bill to make sure that we can act quicker as ne necessary. But we were trying to find a way to uh, still have this occur if the bill were not to pass for some reason. I applaud your creativity, Lucas. Thank you. You're welcome. And I just, uh, for your information, I sent a note to uh, the powers that be asking them what the whole, why the holdup, and I got the same, I got a response saying that um, all these things have to happen, and then there has to be a signature by the lieutenant governor and the speaker, and they don't know what they're accessibility is to come and so I just sent a note back and said why can't they sign electronically in in the case of an emergency I mean we're doing everything remotely and you'd think yeah. that that because I mean what if the the speaker doesn't live that far away but what if the speaker lived in Bennington but or the and, lieutenant governor lived in Bennington but the speaker's had, mother has been in the hospital and has been very ill the speaker has so been also working remotely yeah, I, I, I just it, think it, I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. It is crazy. So anyway, maybe that's one lesson learned, huh? Yeah. All of us uh, should have our own signatures our, on file. Our own processes. Yeah. There has to be a way of somehow encrypting the message so that it can't be, so that they can sign it remotely. Anyway, okay. So what I would suggest is that um, we continue this conversation, think a little bit more about it, have some more people come in. We've got right now a couple things though that I think that, um, and Anthony, are you on the, you're on the transitions one and Brian, you're on the lessons learned? Correct. And Alice. Brian and Al. Yeah. Allison, you're on what? Lessons learned. Okay. So we've got these things here and you we're feeding them to you and then you can feed them back to us oh so, gee yeah, so, so, so ironically i'm on the committee that's looking at education <laughs> all right, okay all right <laughs> it's an imperfect <laughs> well, system but tucker could we could we have maybe have for the next time we meet some kind of um sense of what we might do in terms of like the um ability for the municipalities to be a little more not not just municipalities but also like regional um entities like the planning commissions and stuff to be able to have a little more flexibility around um eliminating the need for a physical location if there's some kind of a declared emergency or if they 
think there's a, an emergency. And there have to be some parameters around it. And then um, uh, I guess the tax department is working on a, a timeline around um, trends around the uh, property tax bills and then specific authority to um, allow them to have reserves and then um, the highway funds. Right. Um, and that's what I've got so far. Yes, and what date would you like all of this by? <laughs> I don't know, maybe so, maybe sometime next week. Okay. If that can work. We can make that work. I know you're I know you are really busy and you're trying to He's do smiling though. That's good. It, you know, at least you didn't say 5:30 today. <clears throat> and I will get it done. <laughs> did you see the um new uh 251 club thing there yes. that they're doing mm -hmm. thank you for sending it how many Tucker okay. how many have you gotten to how many have I gone to and recorded in my journal or how many of the 251 have I driven and toured around aimlessly with my wife those are two different questions you're supposed to record them they're supposed to record them the whole point of our presence was to record them <laughs> You're the lawyer. You now you visit them remotely, given a situation, right? <laughs> yeah, we we operate a drone from a distance and tour the <laughs> municipalities. <laughs> okay, you know, not answering the question. No, he's not. But that's okay. <laughs> we it is. we should not be putting him on the spot. He's so thank hard. you, Mayor, for joining us. And Karen. And you're certainly welcome. I'm going to shift here a little bit to the uh, OPR transitions and lessons learned, if that's okay with everybody. So, yep. This is the mayor. I was just, uh, you do not need me any further. I can sign off. You are welcome to stay, however. <laughs> okay. I, I will sign off just because I, I do need to get back to my, my day work. And I'll note that uh, I finished the 251 Club last year, luckily okay. before COVID happened. So. Uh, how many Great. years? How many years did it take you? Uh, it just took us one year and we oh, right. scheduled a, quite a few trips, uh, a lot of weekend trips where you can travel part of the um, towns and then stay like halfway in between home and there. And then that way there, uh, we were able to hit, you know, sometimes 11 in one day. Whoa. Whoa. Um, but, you know, if, if you think about it, there's some areas like in the Northeast Kingdom where there's not, there's a lot of uh, distance between locations. So. Oh, really? Yeah. But I, I can give uh, tips to anyone who is on it or wants to be on it uh, anytime. So feel free to reach out. Right. Thank you. Did you Thank take you. A, a selfie in every town? Uh, we did. We actually uh, had a schedule where we had to do something in each location. So uh, some places where there was not much to do because there wasn't much there. Uh, if there was a local <laughs> church or a waterfall, uh, we'd also take our picture along with that location. Right. Oh, good for you. Senator That's Bray great. represents one of those, the, the Gore. The Buell's Gore. Right. Avery's right. Gore, Buell's Gore. Right. You know, if you're in um, Athens, Athens, Vermont, it's hard to, I don't know what, maybe the town, you take the town clerks. Their uh, Athens, Vermont is bigger than you might think. I think. <laughs> There's more there than you might think. I've been there. So because have it, I. Because it's one of Vermont's four dry towns. That's right. It is. Which so you can take your picture in front of the non-bar. That's yeah. right. Which were okay. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. All right, Lauren. What do we know from you? Hi, Hi. Lauren. Hi, guys. For the record, Lauren Hibbert, Director of the Office of Professional Regulation. It's great to see all of you. Thank you. It's for great. To see we miss you. Oh, I miss you all uh, very much. Although I, I don't know if you guys have the pleasure of, it's almost the same as testifying and before you, I, all your personalities remain the same remotely and I greatly appreciate it. They do. Oh. 
<laughs> I miss OPR so much. I've started licensing my neighbors on, on the street. <laughs> how, are, how are you licensing them? Hopefully not tattooists, because that actually gives a skill. We're, we're working it out, but... Uh... <laughs> well, we had worked so hard on so many bills right there before the end, um, beginning of COVID. So um, I'm thankful to um, the chair for her advocacy for those bills. And I do think there's some... Um, key pieces in those bills that would help us in the future. Um, so I, I'm grateful for um, the ad advocacy. Um, and the, I do have a couple of things that fit into your bucket, Senator White. Um, the first bucket being, how do we go from crisis to normal? I think mm -hmm. um, the big overarching um, thing that OPR needs, and I suspect most agencies need, is a clear end to the um, state of emergency so that it doesn't just end um, with short notice. There's a lot of things that are baked in to the state of emergency being in effect and it will take some time to unwind what we really put together in quick order in Act 91 um, that I, it, you know, like all of the temporary licenses and all the um, telehealth provisions the expansion of pharmacy scope, if those just went away tomorrow, um, we'd have a communications problem. So um, I understand this may not be the legislature's uh, role to define when the end of emergency is, but um, to those who are listening, you know, some notice of when that's going to end. Um, and um, it sounds like the governor is already planning this, but if the state of emergency continues and we, um, you know, open and close the spigot as we go along, that's a, a better place for um, the regulated community to be in the, as opposed to lifting and then putting the emergency order back together. Um, uh, La Lauren, uh, Jeanette, may I ask a question? Yes. Uh, Lauren, how much, when you say you, you need a clear uh, end, how much time do you anticipate needing to, in order to effectively little temporary uh, you know how, how much time do you need to make it a, a, you know not you well, know a disaster a mess <laughs> i think not a a mess would be you know three or four days um but organized <laughs> and predictable maybe 15 days or 30 days just so that we understand what's happening and the hospitals who are using out-of-state licensees for telehealth have time to to get them off of their payroll or get them appropriately licensed. We have retired people who are working in the state of Vermont on, um, on temporary licenses and they need to know when that authority is going to end. Mm -hmm. there's, there's just a lot that's wrapped up into Act 91, a lot of changes that were really important um, and really effective. Um, quite candidly, I think I think the team that worked on that bill was had a lot of... Um, great ideas that have been, um, you know, at the time, we weren't sure how it was all going to be used, some of us, some pieces, and it's really come together in a very cohesive manner. So, um, have you been able to keep track of those temporary licenses so that we will know, uh, you know, how effective it was, you know, that the Act 91 actually enabled 85 doctors or, you know, whatever. Yes. You have all that so that we can yes there's the there's a group of licensees group of people whose information we are not collecting and that is people who are licensed in another state who are only providing telehealth in this state oh. um and that um seemed logistically most feasible at the time of act 91 going forward if we were going to continue that type of activity on a sustained basis, which I know that there's lots of discussions about telehealth and I'm certainly, you know, I just am the licensing end of telehealth. I'm not the, the end user of the telehealth, um, you know, professionals, but um, so I wouldn't want to speak for facilities, but what I, I would love to be able to collect who's providing telehealth in the state. Um, but that didn't seem logistically feasible at the time that we were crafting 91. Um, that fell into um, my next bucket, which is in place for the next crisis, um, that ability to do that. 
to collect that information um, for people providing telehealth. And it may be something that really needs to be in the telehealth section. Um, but yes, I mean, there's just, there's people working in the state and people working um, in a telehealth capacity out of state that will need to cease practicing when the state of emergency ends. So just logistically, um, we have everybody's email. Um, the facilities know who is providing telehealth. I think if somebody is providing telehealth, like mental health, tele, um, mental health uh, teletherapy to say a kid who, we've seen a lot of people um, providing telehealth to college students who have returned home um, and it has enabled their counselor back where their college was to continue telehealth. Of course, that's important. Um, I think those folks are probably paying attention to what Vermont's state of emergency is and what the authorization is, but it's, it's a communication outreach issue. Um, and I do think we would need some time to have a orderly wind down. And have you, have you had that conversation with the administration? In a, in a, yes, a little bit we have, yes. And I, I believe that uh, in a meeting that we had this morning that uh, Chris and Jenny Lyons and I were in, that she talked a lot about this, about um, trying to figure out what it me what the transition will mean in terms of those temporary licenses and how we how we do it in an orderly manner. Right. So That's a big question. Yeah. Um, um, can I ask a quick question just so I understand? Yep. So telehealth when the the licensing uh, provisions that were flexed in order to help get through this. If the physicians out of state, it was to allow out of state physicians licensed out of state to be able to call Vermonters in Vermont. Is that what we're talking about? There's um, several different. Yes, there's several different categories within Act 91. If you were somebody who was licensed in another state and only providing telehealth, then you did not have to do anything with the state of Vermont. You could just right. you could just provide telehealth. And we were really thinking of scenarios mm -hmm. like Dartmouth, where people um, may not have had a pre-existing um, patient-client relationship, but someone in Vermont wanted to call um, a Dartmouth provider who was not licensed in Vermont um, and triage their um, health concern before going over the state border into New Hampshire because that's their closest hospital. Um, and I do think there's a lot of that going on. And I, I know that, um, that Vermont's approach to this has been very well uh, received by New Hampshire because new, the New Hampshire providers have a lot of clarity about what they can do to Vermont patients, for Vermont patients um, via telehealth. And just one quick follow-up. So you mentioned um, students who have gone home from Vermont colleges and stuff like that. And so if they were uh, seeing a counselor here, are, are those who are not licensed like uh, psychotherapists allowed to call them ordinarily if they're back in Connecticut, for instance? Or I was specifically about somebody who was out of state college student who then came home to Vermont during the COVID crisis. Um, because we don't control what Connecticut um, expects of somebody practicing in Connecticut. We can only control what Vermont expects um, for somebody practicing in Vermont, which providing therapy or any type of telehealth is by definition practicing in Vermont. I see, okay. So, and just the, the last flavor of all this, is it is a Vermont licensed psychotherapist, for instance, um, allowed to talk to a patient when they're out of state, or or are they are they by virtue of talking to a client out of state, practicing medicine in that other state? Generally, it is the latter, Senator Bray. If if you are continuing services in another state, you're, you're practicing in the other state. And many states do what Vermont says, which is if you have a pre-existing relationship, then it may continue. But if you do not, then it is not allowed. Thank you. So Lauren, the, um, some of the issues, uh, I like the pharmacy and I think some of the uh, licensing issues if we were to pass um, 220 and 233, 
and get those in place, that would, th there will probably be a gap between when they become effective, even if they get, and when the emergency ends. My guess is, are they effective upon passage or on in July, those two? The way they're currently written, and um, Ms. Rask, please correct me if I'm wrong, is July 1st of 2020. But okay. um, I'm thinking that those will be modified if that, um, if that, if those bills move, I would be asking that that date change because I think it would happen after that date for in one right. thing. But I also would be looking to have that effective faster than waiting until July of 2021. So, um, no, wait a minute. I now I'm confused. If they're the effective date on them all, except for the massage therapy part is July, 2020. And that the massage one is 2021. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So I, my concern was, did, uh, did I just hear you say you wanted to move that effective date out farther? Or I was thinking that to make it effective upon passage, right. so that you could ask, so there wouldn't be potentially a month or a two month gap between when the emergency was over and those kicked in because some of the, like think, the pharmacy things. I think the miscommunication is you are more optimistic and definitely have more information than I do on how quickly those bills would move. I thought they would not be adopted until after July of 2020. Oh, no, no, I'm, I'm pushing to have them adopted. Um, within the next week. Okay, so um, I mean, not they probably won't get to the governor then, but I'm pushing to have them through the Senate by then. Okay, um, with that clarity, um, yes, I believe that the I would have to go through um, all of the specifics of um, 220 specifically, but I would need to make sure that we could operationalize those upon passage. Mm -hmm. But I think we could. Um, I just would need to go through each section and make sure that, you know, my team could, could do that. Um, I think that would be helpful because some of them, um, I, it dawned on me when you talked about the pharmacy things, because if there's a gap and right. then the bill itself does a lot of the same things that the emergency bill does for the pharmacy. So we don't want to see it stop and then have to start again. So if you did that and, made whatever can be um, effective upon passage, that would be great. I can commit to doing that work and get that to um, Betsy by the end of today. Thank you. Sure. I'm sorry for my uh, density there. No, 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 no. I, I wasn't very clear about that. And just, just so, so that you know that just because I'm pushing doesn't mean it'll happen. Right, but also- I can no. be very pushy, but some pe times people don't listen to me anyway, which is always a surprise to me. Mm -hmm. Well, it's- It's, it's a, a surprise, surprise to you for many too. Uh, but even so, then it would have to go to the house and you know that'll take some time. And, right. And we would be pushing for the house to take it up as a priority also. Right, I, well, I am pushing for that. Well, I, I know, but they- Madam Chair, is that your, your advocacy is effective. I'm testifying on many of these bills. Um, so thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. what do you want next, Lauren? <laughs> <laughs> Be careful. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so in place for the next um, crisis, um, part of what has been very effective with Act 91 is the regulatory orders that we can that I can issue um, when somebody is failing to comply um, with, you know, um, public health standards or um, doing a practice that is not um, safe or in um, conflict with the governor's order has been specifically how we've been issuing these orders. I think we've ordered a handful of them um, and they're primarily have been when people are failing to comply with the stay home, stay safe order. Um, and continuing to practice. 
Um, the pharmacy expansion, um, we've already talked a little bit about, it's gone very smoothly, uh, seamlessly. It's been smooth, it's been without any wrinkles. Um, and um, it has proven to be very important, particularly with the drug shortages uh, that we are currently experiencing and anticipating um, given our, our uh, retail drug supply that comes from China and India, um, it has been uh, greatly impacted by COVID and pharmacists have needed to do um, substitutions within therapeutic class. Um, I think that there's something to be said about um, the larger concepts in 220 with the pharmacy expansion, um, both um, for um, the bill itself, but um, the ability for the commissioner very expressly to issue guidance on what pharmacists can do um, will be helpful, particularly as we look at two pharmacists for um, testing, COVID-19 testing, which I know is um, being contemplated. It also is um, something that um, if there's antibody testing, it's possible that pharmacists could be part of the group to do that work. So um, that, that those sections in 220 um, sort of create a pathway for the commission to be issuing um, more, um, I'm blanking on the word, but more um, sort of like the naloxone standing order, a, a standing order for COVID testing, or whatever the next thing that could happen. Um, the other piece that has been pretty effective, although um, perhaps underutilized at this point because we haven't seen the surge as much as we were originally anticipating was the, re, the retiree renewal. Um, right. Retirees can renew, healthcare retirees can renew if they've been out of practice for up to three years. Um, I would love to see, and the entire OPR would, team would love to see that added permanently to Title III um, emergency um, statutes. Um, it would, I think it'd be important to not make it specific to healthcare, but any licensee type that is relevant to the emergency because we could have another hurricane um, or tropical storm, like tropical storm Irene, where what we did during that um, state of emergency was issue a lot of engineering licenses. So right, exactly. If it could be not tied to healthcare, but could be um, have a wider scope than is what is currently in Act 91, I think that would be helpful. Um, and the um, piece that 91 added permanently to Title III about um, allowing for emergency licensure of graduates who are unable to take their exam because of a state of emergency has been, um, I don't have the numbers, I could, I could get them to this committee, but we've issued, I think, in at least maybe a hundred of those licenses. Oh, really? Um, That's great. The, nationally, the, the exam landscape is um, greatly disrupted. Um, nurses are unable to take the NCLEX, um, engineers are unable to take their exams. I mean, it's just, it's a hard time to graduate um, from college or a master's or doctoral program having spent your entire um, last several years dedicated to a profession. And that exam is usually the last piece that's required. Um, and uh, exam providers are following CDC guidelines and then can only have, um, at sometimes it was, you know, 10 people together in a room. And so you think of the exam proctor, the person who admits it, you're then at, you're at eight people um, and an entire graduating force um, of students who are anxious to get into the workplace. So that emergency grad licensing, um, I, it was added permanently to Title III, but it has been really, really important. Was it permanently added for more than nurses? Yes, it's-, it's okay all licensees and that was okay in okay um and yeah. we've been issuing it for non-healthcare licenses as well. okay um the open meeting laws um we haven't yet um had really an open meeting since uh we've been remote um i've been using there's a power in um act 91 that i can act on behalf of the board if 
um, necessary if, it's un if we're unable to convene a meeting. And I have been using that power both for disciplinary orders and some regulatory decisions. Um, but we are about to start using some open meetings for boards. Um, we're having a dental board meeting tomorrow. Um, that ability to have a remote open meeting is really crucial to us. Um, we do rely on our boards for professional expertise. Even in a state of emergency, I don't wanna be making um, all of the decisions in a silo without them and I don't wanna violate open meetings. So that ability to have a remote meeting is crucial. Um, and I, I think that remote meetings, um, people are going to be expecting them just as an access um, to information to not have to travel. Um, I'm, I'm anticipating tomorrow, we're gonna have quite a few people participating in our remote dental meeting. Um, and I, I truly anticipate that for our boards, um, remote participation will start to become a standard request. So, so um, Betsy, what, Betsy Ann, when, um, if Tucker drafts something up <laughs> for flexibility for municipalities, maybe this can be um, tagged onto that. And so is the suggestion to just add it as a permanent um, authority to do open meetings by all remote participation? I, I think in the same, were you with us when we were talking about it for municipalities with um, so that if there is a declared state of emergency, um, that you don't have to have the physical location. Mm -hmm. If there, if there isn't, then um, my preference would be that you would still have the physical location. That it wouldn't be all, all um, remote, but that in specific instances there could be more flexibility by the municipality or by the particular board. To, to say, I mean, if the Secretary of State's offices get washed away when the river floods, maybe there isn't a physical location. And so in that state of emergency, they have the ability to, to the flexibility to say, um, it's gonna be all remote. But the fallback would be to have a physical location and a remote meeting where possible. And I think Tucker has some language, but I was just thinking we might be able to add this. Does that make sense, committee? Brian? It does. I meant to mention this earlier when we were speaking only of municipalities. I would not be in favor of giving authority if there's a snowstorm to no. not meet. It, it has to be a real, I like the declared state of emergency clause period, but I could also understand where the local uh, municipality could, in very, very rare circumstances also employ that method. I mean, Allison mentioned a, an ice storm. Well, if it was as bad as it, it was going to be, then I would have assumed that the governor or uh, would have, you know, made some sort of declaration. I don't know. I think it's, I think we need to tap the brakes a little bit on that and not just say, oh, well, it's snowing, we're not going to meet. No, no, no. I, agree I don't mean you. to I say that it, we did. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Brian. I think that it needs to be set within some strict parameters because yeah. I don't want to see the um, select board say, oh my God, there's going to be 10 inches tomorrow night. And so we're, we're not going to have a physical meeting. If it's going to be that bad, maybe they just need to cancel the meeting. Yep, agreed. Thank you. But give them a little bit of flexibility and then see what happens. And if people start abusing it, then we yank it back. Well, may, may I? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, I wasn't just envisioning um, weather related challenges or, uh, but also, you know, with many of our towns still have only three select board members, it's possible there could be all sorts of health reasons why they could be. If the three remote. people are sick, then they shouldn't have the meeting. I, I, I think that we, if we make it too broad, we're going to end up really limiting people's ability to participate because you can watch them, but you can't well, participate. Well, but but we can as we watch the governor's press conference. It, 
people are able to ask questions in a way they can never do when they're just watching the select board meeting after the fact on access television. But but if you if you if we have a select board meeting and it's a Zoom meeting, only the people that can participate that are invited can participate. So when there's a physical location, I can walk down to the town hall and go to the meeting. I didn't have to be asked to invite. I didn't have to ask to be invited. But on a Zoom meeting, if I wanted to participate, I would have to ask to be invited and then they would have to invite me. No, I don't. Participate. I, I don't actually believe that's the case. You can have an open Zoom meeting where everyone could conceivably uh, participate if they had a system okay. for raising their hand and stuff. I mean, it, I just I just had one like that, and and okay. I had members of the public who were able to participate who were not on the agenda or anything. Okay, Chris, I still think we have to have a pretty tight parameters, Chris. Yeah. Well, the right I. I shared the chair's concern because if you want to have security in a meeting as in have it under your control the way you normally could if you're running a select board meeting not getting zoom bomb for instance you have to have that you have to have people invited and then let them in and uh that means people who aren't uh they register basically will have a limited ability to participate uh, so I, I, you know, we're talking about having meeting other meetings in the state house, like a public hearing, for instance, and it gets a little, the uh, IT is still sorting out how to have a broad public meeting, uh, but not lose control of that meeting, which right. is a concern that they, they have. We don't really have a very good version of, um, you know, 200 people showing up in the state house and 80 of them getting on the witness list at the moment, although they're sorting it out. Yeah, I think we're going to have answers and, and methods for doing that sooner than we think. Well, that might be, but I still, if we're going to do some legislation around this, I want it to be pretty tight that, that giving the flexibility to select boards within con some constraints. I agree. Betsy? Betsy? Is it to be determined on what those constraints would be when I pass this info on to yeah. Tucker? Okay. Should I just say it might be during a declared state of emergency or some other standard that Senate GovOps will discuss? Yeah. Well, it, it so it could be during a, a a state of emergency that precludes you from meeting in person. I mean, there could be a state of emergency that has nothing to do with your ability to get together, and. Um, and and then some parameter, some flexibility for the the municipalities, but I don't think we've discussed it, what those parameters are yet. So, Allison. So in this conversation, you know, it might make some sense to have Kevin Moore uh, talk with us about what is possible as we look at some of this flexibility and and. Uh, and technological, but and the flexibility that technology enables. So, uh, I think it would be helpful. Maybe during the course of our lessons learned, we should, you know, loop in uh, Janet or Ke and Kevin because they've done a ton of this work, preparing and thinking about uh, and preparing us for all sorts of different types of emergencies. Chris, well, and the other so. I think you're right. I mean, to me, I agree. The whole idea of writing careful constraints, the, the technology is changing so fast. I don't, I don't want us to sort of get sucked in to right. talking too much about what Zoom does yeah. now or doesn't. Because only uh, 10 days ago was the first time I saw that, oh, well, you can have a webinar in Zoom and they just, you know, they keep changing stuff. So I think plain old statutory language that is protective of meetings is going to be important, no matter what the technology is that's used to deliver it. Okay. So we, we can discuss those parameters later. And I don't think the parameters have to do with the technology, in my mind. The parameters have to do with when, when they can actually 
say we're not going to have a physical location and I don't want them to say we're going to not going to have a physical location just because my road hasn't been plowed yet and I'm on the select board. I mean, so. So it, we're, we're, this is just the first day we're thinking about this. So I mean, right. I think, right, right. it just gets us. Yes, we are going to have this going. Yeah. Yes, we are going to have this conversation more. Okay, so Lauren. And, and I didn't mean to get into all of those weeds. What I was just suggesting <laughs> is if we could have open meetings, meetings remotely when there's a state of emergency, that would be very helpful if it means that we can't yeah. connect physically. And the other piece that I think we all are gonna have to adjust to is that the public is becoming uh, adept and used to being able to log in virtually to meetings. And so there's a, there's a minutes um, issue there, there's a record issue there. I, I think that our professional boards are, members of the, the licensees are going to want to be able to participate in more meetings remotely once we start. Um, and I fully anticipate that when we get back to normal, however that looks, OPR will have a physical meeting and it will also be broadcast virtually. Yeah. And it will become part of our standard practice because the amount of people that are in this virtual room, I assume, are far greater than could fit into your committee room um on any given day so in some ways the virtual world is more expansive too and i think folks are going to get used to that so that's the only piece that i'm sort of anticipating for the future is yep. how do we do we store these meetings um so there's always a, a record of it we've never recorded our public meetings before um we've just kept minutes so it's those sorts of things that i'm sort of thinking about in the future in terms of public open meetings uh -huh. Um, and then the, the third bucket um, is what have we learned? And um, the big pieces are when appropriate, expanded scope really helps everybody in a state of emergency. Um, pharmacy expanded scope, there was not a lot of controversy over when we enacted Act 91, it was an appropriate expansion. Another piece of that um, that I don't wanna lose track of is the collaborative practice um, requirements for APRNs, those are waived in Act 91. I'm not advocating to this committee that you add that into permanent legislation today. I think that will would need a lot more discussion and, um, and you know, stakeholder engagement, but that there was very little discussion over that. And that previously I would have said would have been something very political, but it clearly, there was consensus that that was needed in the state of emergency. So, um, I'm just bookmarking that for a future conversation. Um, telehealth, telehealth, telehealth is so important. Um, that's been a big lesson learned. I think um, not only for OPR, we've all had to, at, at OPR, we've had to become much more competent talking about telehealth, trying to figure out exactly what people, what the question is that people have been asking us and responding to it based on the Act 91 guidance. But um, it's just been, um, telehealth has been the theme of, OPR the last eight weeks. Um, so for, may I just ask a question? Um, yes. Okay, for those of us who aren't on healthcare, uh, give me an example of how you, other than allowing it and, and relaxing the regulation on it, how has it co consumed you for the last eight weeks? I don't get how, how well, why it's been so, what is your ongoing yeah. involvement with Who it? can do it? How do you document it? Um, how it. essentially has been the large um, pieces? And so far, have you, so far it's all been good? I think I mean, so. I, I, yes, I, I think telehealth um, has been, we've been able to answer the questions we've been able to provide guidance um whenever we can um and yes i i think that people have not had adverse experiences from telehealth that we've heard from yet and the billing also i mean that's not your department so much but has the i mean it's wrapped up in it is the billing worked well too i think so i i would want you to probably hear not from me on billing because it's really outside of what um, we focus on. We have referred people um, 
to other departments on billing questions, um, but I have not gotten very involved in billing. I know that there's there's different billing structures for telehealth and um, and some of that is within Act 91. Thanks. And I trust that the, the telehealth crew is looking at that. The other, Are there big, the other big for piece is just um, interagency communication. Um, I don't know how much um, control this committee has, but over that or how much anybody has over that, but um, any opportunity that we can communicate better interagency. Um, and I think, I think it does speak a little bit to some of the consolidation issues that um, sometimes we talk about in this committee. You know, um, David Harley and I have been in closer communication during this state of emergency than we have previously. That's um, great. But um, it is great. Um, but there's um, sometimes it's unclear which licensing agency folks need to communicate with. Um, and people have registered on our site that need to register with health and vice versa. Um, there's been a lot of questions on reopening um, and um, and how that's being done. Um, that's just a big area of conversation right now of how we safely and responsibly get these um, help, these professions back into the workforce and how we communicate with them. So um, there's been some great times and some hard times, but we're working through them. But it's um it's a it's a struggle to to figure out how to communicate effectively as one government front. So maybe we need to continue to look at um, the bringing um, licensing into the same place. I mean, that, that we need to kind of, this shows us that we need to continue that conversation. I think it does. Um, and I think it does because um, then when people think of licensing, they think of one spot. Right. Um, and that would be really helpful whether it's health for all healthcare licensing or whether it's OPR for all licensing, but it has led to some, some confusion and um, I think it would be helpful. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, so we'll have that, con yes. I mean, I just remind, uh, uh, Lauren, would you be kind enough to remind us how many licenses we still don't, you still don't oversee? We don't oversee um, the doctors, the MDs, the um, physician's assistant, the podiatrist, and the anesthesia assistant, um, and plumbers and electricians and teachers. Um, I think there's still some outstanding bills of registration, obviously massage being one of them, I think that, uh, and home contractors being the other one, both professions that had the government been able to communicate with easily in the state of emergency, it would have been helpful. Um, uh, that bill no one's making that a priority in the house unfortunately we're we're right you're you're speaking about home contractors yeah i don't believe it is a priority in the house and i don't know if it's appropriate to be but it is right. an interesting point i think is that when there's guidance being issued from the governor or from accd and it's related to one of our professions we can email them all within 20 minutes um and we have a list, we can prep it, and we can email the guidance. Um, and that is something that we do not have the ability to do with home contractors and massage therapy. Right. Thanks. Okay. Oh. Brian? Thank you, Madam Chair. Lauren, can I ask you, and I'm not sure how much of what you just gave us falls into the lessons learned pot or the going forward pot, whatever that other group is called, but it would be helpful um, if you could because yeah, I saw you were reading notes, so you must have written it down. If you can just put that into an email and ship it off, one of us is going to have to be responsible for telling another group of people where you are in terms of what you learned and what you hope to see uh, change going forward. And I don't know whether that's going to be Senator Polina or, so, or myself or Senator Clarkson, but it would it would be helpful to at least have the information. Thank I would you. be happy to do that. I was absolutely looking at notes. You were right. And That's yes, okay. the line between in place, and I'll just show you, these are my notes. They're pretty 
<laughs> we like it. Else, but I'll, I'll make them better. Um, they look like my notes. <laughs> they don't have to be particularly fancy. Well, they'll be in a Word document, not chicken scrawling, but the line between in place for the next crisis and what we've learned is very gray to me because what mm -hmm. we've learned, we need to put in, in place for the next crisis, I'm hoping, so. Um, right. yeah. Thank you. Anything else, committee, from Lauren? Well, Just also, if we get, and when we get, I should say, 233 to the finish line in the Senate, I will still need your help because a lot of what I left is still up at the state house and I don't have a printer here. So I'm gonna literally be looking at two different screens to try to, and I'll need Betsy's help too, obviously with floor notes, which are not like the same type of floor notes as before, but we'll get it done. I will, I will absolutely help you. Um, All right. Thank you. And, yes, I'll ask. and then you'll look at the um, effective dates with yes. Betsy on both 233 and 220. Mm -hmm. You got it. I, I think 233, well, on both of them, yeah, if there are, if we need to make some different effective dates. And then, um, okay, so we, there's some, some things in here that uh, I think a lot of this will go into what health and welfare is working on, but there are some things in here that might, um, we might put in to some um, more permanent statutes like regulatory orders that can, you can issue and um, things like that. And standing orders for COVID equipment. So anything else that, so we'll continue this discussion and we're gonna wait for this other group to send us some words of wisdom and then we'll put them all together and who knows where we'll go. Okay, sounds great. Thank you so much for thank you, Lauren. Me Thanks, out Lauren. Great to see you. Hey, right. thanks. So, committee, I just got a um, a note from Secretary Bloomer, and he Another. said that the LG is signing the three forty four tomorrow, and he has a meeting. He's meeting the speaker at two forty five tomorrow to sign for her to sign. So that'll, well, then that'll go to the what? governor tomorrow. Here's another immediate thing that could be a letter from us, which is we need to have everyone to have a, an ability to do electronic signatures. Well, I, mean, I think that, that's, that could be a I letter. Think that's, I think that's something that we should take up with the pro tem and around. Um, and I think that's probably a joint rules and issue. I'm not sure, but it probably uh, is one of the procedural rules of the of the General Assembly. So uh, I am sure it is, but it is clearly identified as something. If we want to do something fast and in a time right. fashion that affects thousands of Vermonters, like this that bill did, uh, it it would have been great for us to be able to have moved it in a timely fashion. Yeah, I think we should. I'll I will send my next letter. Yes. One of those white missives. You heard of white papers? These are white missives. Yeah. Chris? Um, and what's our schedule on 788? Did, are we take that up for a... a 788 vote? is... Um, they're going to have a rules committee meeting yeah. tomorrow right after the floor, I believe. And okay. um, isn't that what Tim said this morning? And right. then we'll get permission to vote on that and 438 and 554. And um, 558, if we, it, but we need to hear the testimony on 558 first, but on those three. So okay. when you're, are we gonna vote on those tomorrow then? Well, we'll get permission to vote on, no, we're not meeting tomorrow. We have a floor session, but the committee's not meeting tomorrow. The committee isn't meeting tomorrow. Oh, I thought we were. I thought no. we were. We had oh, Monday, oh, Tuesday, you're right. and you're Friday. Right. Monday, Tuesday, and Friday. It was you're Wednesday. Right. We can't. So we, we are meeting tomorrow, I believe. Yeah. If we, we can, we can vote on 788 if we get permission. And if 438, if Betsy and Jen have the amendments, we can vote on that. And we could, 
um, I'll, we'll have Karen um, or somebody from Weathersfield, perhaps their Senator might speak to us about the Weathersfield charter change. Yeah, and, and, and we could also get the rep who's been very involved. Maybe we could get Anne Marie Christensen to testify. Yeah, usually we have somebody from the, the House GovOps who reported it, but whatever, just so that we, um, I don't think it wasn't controversial or anything, but just so that we have some testimony. And that, so we could have permission to vote on those three tomorrow. Once you get the permission, will you inform me so I can add it to the agenda? Yes, I will. And I won't, I won't get the permission until after the, floor session okay tomorrow but um and 788 i don't think most people care about that at all that should take us about four minutes if that we, we care about it because jen and betsy and care about it i was planning on a full report on that yeah exactly the one i was planning on a full report on was 438 the medical board nine 90 minutes was what i thought is that about right? <laughs> That's what I, I thought too. I watched Senator Maza on the floor and when he starts putting his palm against his head, I know the report's getting a little long. <laughs> I, I figure that 788 should take about th four minutes to report. And it's that introductory thing that Jen gave us about why they're doing it. And if it's published, we don't have to go through every vote. And I believe that, let's see, who who all, who all volunteered to report that? Oh, we haven't voted on it yet, so nobody- We haven't volunteered. discussed it yet. Yeah. Okay. 788? Yeah, 788. No, that's yours. No. Yeah, he's, I'll, that's I'll do the technical. It's Chris's. Yeah. I'll do 438. Yeah. I'll do Weathers, I'll do Weathersfield. Oh, boy, good. I thought Brian always okay. So anyway, we can do that. We'll do that um, tomorrow. We'll look at those tomorrow, and we do have the charter, the Weathersfield Charter, actually on the agenda. We yes, don't have the other two elections and military, right? Yeah, we're going to look at lessons learned um, uh, around elections and around the military. Okay. And who should we invite tomorrow? Is there anything, anybody who's not on the current agenda that we need to bring in? I didn't look at who's on there. Um, we, it, did we ask Anne Marie Christensen or the whoever, whoever reported the, the Weathersfield uh, thing, the charter? Nope. We could invite whoever reported it from GovOps. Yeah. It was probably uh, Jim Harrison. Doesn't he do all there? Charters. Many, many of them, yes. Yeah. And, and what about uh, General Knight? Wow. Good. Whose dog Good. was that? That was mine. She's this tiny, sweet little thing that has this oh. bark that scares the heck out of everybody. You must be saying it's time <laughs> to go. <laughs> it, it, it's the opposite of my friend who. When she sneezed, this is the way she sneezed. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> anyway, there are right. many days, many days that we don't get mail because of this dog. <laughs> All right. So, do we have? Are there other things that we need to talk about today? No, that all sounds good. Okay, I have. I am meeting um, at three thirty with um, the pro tem and the speaker uh, to talk about elections. He mentioned, uh, the governor mentioned it at the end of his, uh, oh, at, it was brought up today. I, I tuned in at the end of his press conference. And I he, didn't hear it, Brian, did you? I did I, not, we were, uh, we were here. Oh, uh, oh. No, we were in agriculture. No. It, yeah, you, it, it was like at like quarter of one, uh, between 12.30 and quarter of one, I was listening to it in the car, oh. and uh, he was deferring to the Secretary of State pretty much completely. Well, I think that's what his letter said. When I read his letter, what it seemed to me to say is, 
get everything all ready. And the only thing that doesn't happen until, and it wouldn't happen until September anyway, is to mail them. Uh, but everything has to be ready, just like the field hospitals were ready. <coughs> right. Uh, so. so did that come from Kendall today? I haven't seen it. No, I yeah. didn't get anything from Kendall. So where do you know this? Where is this letter? I missed the go. Oh, I, th I thought um, the uh, Secretary uh, of State sent it to me. I thought I forwarded it to everybody. Oh, today? I know. I haven't seen it. Last week. I'll, I'll re-forward it. I'm sorry. I, I seem to have... I'll re-forward it. Right. Don't worry. I don't think I don't think we got that. Okay. Thank I'll, you, Anthony, for I have to go. I'm on with the speaker yep. with the okay. program right now. Bye, Bye. everybody. Bye. See you.